welcome to the Sports Playbook, where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I'm your host, Angela Hazlett. Today's guest is Katie Baker, the Sporting Director for USA Curling. We are here to discuss curling in the spotlight, an Olympic and Paralympic sport. Welcome, Katie. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Katie, I know you have a really interesting work history and going from working almost 12 years for the national governing body um, or NGB of the sport of triathlon to 11 years in sport performance for the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee or USOPC. Now, as of July of 2022, you're back to working with another national governing body for the sport of curling. So how has this career trajectory informed your approach in your current role as sporting director of USA Curling? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I would say I was fortunate at USA Triathlon to have some great mentors around me, um, both learning like best practices in terms of sport performance at the highest level without taking into consideration the sport specific information that needs to be applied. Um, so fortunate that I, again, worked with some amazing people and learned a lot at that during that time. Um, then moving over to the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, first starting on the Olympic side and working with a portfolio of Olympic sports, I was the point of contact for five Olympic sports that all, a couple of them manage Paralympic programs, but really being the point of contact for all things for the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, but more specifically in the performance realm, um, and then moving over and focusing solely on the Paralympic programs that NGBs were managing. Um, so it's been fantastic in terms of moving me along and, uh, educating me and me learning about a sport at the highest level, but also I really appreciate the time that I spent with Paralympics and learning about the Paralympic movement, um, and just understanding from an NGB perspective, the challenges that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis at a national governing body as well as stepping away that, you know, bigger global look from the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. And so now coming back to the NGB, being able to, A, see what we did at triathlon and trying to put some of that, apply some of those learnings uh, with USA Curling, but also working at the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, understanding resources that are available to us as national governing bodies and really being able to, um, probably a lot of my former colleagues are tired of hearing from me because I ping them quite honestly in terms of, hey, we need some help with this or we need some support in this area. So um, it's really set me up first, I hope for success. I mean, proof will be in the pudding um, you know, down the road, it's only three months into the job, but just having a real, I feel a clear understanding of, okay, what, what do we really need to focus in on, hone in on, what do the priorities need to be in terms of really writing the ship here, you know, at USA Curling in terms of high performance. And you have a, a good solid network, as you mentioned, to lean into and, and kind of learn some best practices. So I'm sure your time there and previous uh, positions were very valuable to contribute um, for that. Do you, So you've had a history of working with both Olympic and Paralympic athletes. Are you working with both Olympic and Paralympic athletes now, or do you work for kind of um, one group? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I oversee my... My role oversees all sports, so that's Olympic, Paralympic, you know, coaching education will fall under me, um, not haven't even scraped the surface there yet, um, as well as athlete development, which is another area that needs a lot of attention in our sport. So right now, the focus has really been on the Olympic and Paralympic program. Um, so yeah, I mean, I ideally in an ideal world, we'll get to a point where the athletes whether it's ideal or not, they're only coming to me with like major issues, but they are working with, we've got the foundation built. We've got all of the policies, procedures, 
um, in place that there's no questions about how athletes qualify for teams, how they're getting funded to X, Y, or Z, how they access certain resources in the science area, like nutrition, um, sports psychology, strength and conditioning. There's no questions about that. They understand how that happens. And these aren't arbitrary decisions that are being made, but it's based on performance on the field of play. Um, so we've got that built out, which is what I'm working on right now, but then they're only coming to me with issues, which hopefully they won't have a lot of. Um, so really directing them to the directors of the, pro the respective programs, and then those things getting filtered to me or them coming directly to me if they need to. So you know, in, in a weird way, it's like, yes, I de I'll deal with the athletes and um, well, I want to hear from them in terms of an understanding. That's what I've spent a lot of time the first three months really listening to athletes, listening to coaches, you know, what's working, what's not working, what needs to be improved here, where are the opportunities, um, where do we just need to get better and really kind of being able then to apply what I'm, what I'm hearing from both the coaches and the athletes. So even though you have over 20 years working in Olympics and Paralympic and in industry, there's still a learning curve because it's a new sport, a new organization is what I'm hearing you say. And is there any challenges in kind of switching hats as far as communication or perception of, of working? There's a lot of governing agencies that you have to report to or requirements that you have through the USOPC, through international um, bodies? You know, is there anything um, in regards to the governance structure that makes your job particularly challenging? I mean, I will say, I mean, you bring up a good point in terms of when I was at USA Triathlon, there was no safe sport. There was no center for safe sport. And so I think that that plays into everything in this day and age and, and being aware of that center and why it exists and the, you know, policies in place that ensure that we are keeping athletes safe. So that wasn't in, you know, that didn't exist back, you know, in the early two thousands. And so I think whether it's a, you know, I don't want to say a hindrance cause it's necessary, but there are additional, um, things that need to happen around safe sport. And that's, I wouldn't say that that's coming from a, um, I mean, it's, that's being dictated basically by Congress, you know, Congress down to the USOPC, which then gets directed down to the national governing bodies. And then I guess in addition to that, some of the fallout, unfortunately, of, you know, things that have happened the last four years, um, six years with, with sport and, and what happened at gymnastics is a lot of compliance um, requirements that, again, you, the, Congress has mandated the USOPC as oversight over these sport organizations that they just have a little bit more of an understanding of the day-to-day -day business of NGBs. Um, so they put a lot of, and they being USOPC has put a lot of compliance requirements in place to ensure that, okay, all of, not just in the safe sport realm, but in other areas of business and just general practice governance that they're adhering to what the USOPC is, is really um, requiring them to do. Now that's fairly new, the audit and compliance piece of things. So um, we'll go through that process next year of a USOPC um, compliance audit. And just again, going through are we meeting all of their requirements to be a certified national governing body? And that's also something new that I did not experience or was fairly, I would have been removed from probably at triathlon, but with a smaller national governing body, like curling, like it's going to hit everyone's plates in terms of everyone, um, you know, everyone coming together to ensure that we're meeting all of those requirements. Yeah. And you, the U.S. Center for Safe Sport is an organization that provides training and resources 
with the endeavor to end abuse in sports. So that's what you're kind of referencing there. Um, and it has to be mentioned, I know USA Curling is going through some challenges right now with the CEO, Jeff Plush, who's come under scrutiny for allegations of failing to act when confronted with allegations of abuse and misconduct that occurred under his watch as commissioner of the National Women's Soccer League. Your board of directors has released a statement of support for the CEO's continued leadership with USA Curling, but there's some conflict with the USA Curling's diversity task force who's called for removal of his leadership. So what I'd like to ask you is what do you see as your role in eliminating abuse in sport in your work with high-performing athletes? Yeah, I mean, I guess there... As, as we've spoken about, I mean, there needs to be a relationship with the athletes in terms of building trust with them, that they feel comfortable um, and they know that you are available to listen to their concerns. And that, as, as we spoke about earlier, is something that I'm currently doing is meeting with all of our national team athletes and um, discussing where, where we're at in terms of what's working with the program, what's not. But that's more, you know, in the space of, performance like what are we doing well what do we need what's where do we where can we get better where's there room for improvement so that you guys can succeed at the highest level um so I guess in terms of making myself available like I'm going to take every call every email any um any type of outreach from an athlete who just wants to have my ear for whatever it may be um to hear that if they do have concerns. So um, I think everyone has a part and a lot of it's listening. I mean, we do have the duty to report to the center if, you know, allegations are brought forward, whether they're based on, you know, you've experienced it firsthand and witnessed it, or if it's just someone passing it on to you, like I have an obligation to report these things to the center. Um, which definitely would do moving forward. Fortunately, I've never been in that situation um, and hopefully never have to be in that situation. But I, I think it comes back to, you know, trust, like athletes trusting that, that I will do the right thing at the end of the day. Absolutely. And I know a lot of states have legislation that, require mandatory reports for people who work with youth, but this is an interesting um, obligation that requires mandatory reporting for any of the athletes who are part of the membership of USA Curling and other national governing bodies. Let's talk about uh, mental health and athlete mental health, because that's another issue that's been spotlighted recently and of concern. I know the USOPC provides high performing athletes access to sports psychologists, but what other measures does USA Curling take or encourage for its athletes' mental well-being? Yeah, I mean, they've the USOPC has really done a great job of building out their mental health resources to athletes and um, I don't know exactly when, but maybe four years ago, they created an athlete services department really to support athletes directly. Uh, and through that department, there are many resources built out in the mental health space. And in addition to that, there are um, providers that can are available you know, in terms of mental health crises or not even crises, if they need to reach out to someone and have a conversation. And um, so the USOPC has done a great job of building out that group of individuals to support athletes in more of the mental health space. Um, and again, doing a lot, just trying to understand you know, if it's in sport, if it's like at retirement, like what, what can we do to better support these athletes so that they're not in a place where, you know, they're not feeling supported and, you know, floundering quite honestly, in terms of like, what are the next steps in my life? And my, you know, I've identified as an athlete my whole life and now I'm retiring and who am I? And there's, you know, we see a lot of that. And so there's been great, great support in that space at the USOPC. Another thing that they've done is they've added, I think in Tokyo a little over a year ago, and then most recently Beijing at the 
Olympic and Paralympic Games, they had actual mental health officers in each village. So those individuals were available if athletes needed support in that space, aside from sports psychology. And I know the village that I worked in, in in Beijing, we had an awesome volunteer um, out of Cleveland who worked with the athletes and was, again, just available. It's nothing that's pushed on them, but, you know, they're made aware that that resource is available. And, um, you know, if they had a bad race and they aren't feeling great, like, again, it's sometimes a fine line of what sports psychology and what's more of that psychological support that they need. But this individual was available for them, just like every other village, they had someone supporting them in that space. Yeah. And by sports psychology, you mean kind of motivating athletes to perform at their peak versus psychological counseling and support for their mental health and well-being. Exactly. And so you have a lot of um, athletes who have different needs. They're spread out throughout the country. Some of them maybe live in different areas or remote locations. So there's a lack of community for some of these athletes. Do you feel like that contributes to um, challenges with mental health? Do you mean on the broader like Olympic Paralympic scale or? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I think that, you know, it was, it was very new when it was introduced this idea of like, okay, it's not just sports psychology, but it's also like providing support to an athlete holistically and recognizing, okay, yes, there's the athlete, but there's also the human being. And so I think it was a little bit slow in terms of athletes, like engaging in that and I don't want to say accepting it, but acknowledging, okay, there is a need here, but I think that, um, athletes have, have really taken to it. And, and, and to your point, I mean, knowing athletes are spread out and it's, everything's very, we're a large country geographically and people are all over the place. But I think that, um, if the athlete reaches out, the support's going to be there one way or another. And it is definitely, I know it's, I mean, not that I've had a personal conversation, but I know I've heard on, you know, smaller calls with CEO Sarah Hirschland that that's definitely a priority for her is to support athletes holistically, um, recognizing, yes, we want to support performance on the field of play. And and we do have a, a mission or the USOPC has a mission of sustained competitive excellence, but also supporting athletes holistically. So it's kind of expanded a little bit um, beyond just the performance on the field of play. I don't know if that answers your question very well. I I think it's a a broad answer on that there you're leveraging opportunities to connect people to the resources that they need. And there's not as much of a geographic barrier perhaps as there has been historically. So I think that's encouraging. Let's talk about a little bit about the growth of the sport. So nearly 63% of your members are between the ages of 36 to 49 years old. 21% are between 50 to 64 years of age. So it's always crucial to get a younger age groups to ensure that a sport will be sustained for future generations. So how are you looking to drive growth for that younger generation? And this is curling specific. Curling specific. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is something that is on the list of um, things that we need to dig into. Curling, curling is an interesting, has been an interesting sport for me to like really like dig into and understand. And my first, second week, I guess it was second and third week of the, on the job, like scheduling calls with each of our skips. And, you know, if you don't know the sport of curling, skips are essentially like, almost like your captain slash coach on ice. They're the people that are really um, driving the the strategy in the game and determining what shots are taken and this and that. And so they're kind of like your leader on each of the teams. And our teams are four to five individuals brought together to be on this team. So having conversations with each of the skips on our, on the, all of the teams that, compose the national team. So that's from like our adult seniors down to like under 25s to our juniors. Um, 
discuss, having an understanding from them of, okay, how did you find the sport of curling? And I would say, well, definitely every single one of them, oh, my parents played, my grandparents played. So curling's definitely this like generational sport that gets like, you know, passed down from generation to generation. And so trying to dig into a little bit more of like, how do we pull in first timers that aren't introduced to the sport? Um, that's going to definitely be a challenge for me just to grow because we don't have a large athlete pool. And so, I mean, we need to expose more people to the sport and we need to just build up our pool. I think that the way that we're going to do that is through the club system, um, clubs all over the country, just doing a better job of communicating with the clubs and providing like, well, I think it's, it's up to the clubs to determine what time of, what type of programming they're offering to their members, but also just trying to prove that there's value in some of the programs that we can showcase to them so that, that they can pass that on. So I think that's one thing is just, again, better communication with our clubs and our regions, quite frankly, um, to drive some of that. And just, again, providing more programming to athletes and, and also, again, recruiting these first timers into the sport um, the other thing that has been fascinating to me is coaching or lack thereof. There really is not a strong coaching network. And I've had many conversations, you know, people have reached out to me um, within the curling community that aren't necessarily on our national team and having discussions ar around with them around, okay, you know, where you're from, your area of the country, what does the coaching look like? And um, that piece is very, it, it's not very strong or built out. And what can we do there to, okay, let's give our coaches or potential coaches the skill set to do more coaching. And um, I think if some of that existed, you're going to be able to pull people in as well. Um, historically it's been like, oh, it's like beer league. Like we go and, and we curl and then we sit around and we, we drink beer and there's always going to be those people and there's nothing wrong with that. But then also how can we, um, provide some support to these people who want to take it to the next level? Um, so still working out what that's exactly going to look like, um, in terms of building membership, I mean, I will say one thing that has helped is, well, I'm Team Schuster winning the gold medal in, in 2018 in Pyeongchang. Um, you know, I think that from what I've heard from a lot of people like, oh, yeah, curling, like I saw Team Schuster, you know, they won the gold and that was awesome. And people like identified with them because, you know, they were kind of they're a fun group of of athletes, fun fruit group of guys. And, um, so people identified with that, but that's every four years, you know, and again, hearing people like, oh yeah, curling, I watch it during the Olympics. And then what happens yet yeah, the rest of the, you know, that's once every four years. So what are we doing? And I know that, um, definitely an area that, that Jeff wants to focus on is bringing more broadcast and just more attention to and just highlighting the sport of curling and getting it on TV and and building out maybe more of like a series in the United States. The Canadians have this Grand Slam series that you know people tune in and people like sell out like coliseum type of venues and you know can we get to that place? Um, so I think there's a lot of things that will, lots of things that will hopefully contribute to just building membership, pulling more people into the sport. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Canada, they have a pretty good infrastructure in place already. So it's a matter of building that infrastructure, which I imagine would also include facilities, having access to the right space for people to train and learn the sport to train and, and to compete. So um, is there any chance that you'll uh, look at building out a facility or a center for athletes to to use and to gather? Or is there something in the works right now? 
Yeah, I mean, nothing. They're, you know, conversations. Our athletes, I would say about 40 to 50% of our national team athletes train in the Twin Cities. And some of them have moved there to be a part of the national team program. Not that that's a requirement. Um, right now, the challenge there is we, we do have a relationship with the Vikings training facility, um, which is just outside of, of uh, Minneapolis, um, not too far from the airport, but we've got a strength and conditioning coach that works out of there, a dietitian, and then our sports psychologist um, isn't too far away. So they've got those support, you know, those support services in place in that area. So athletes have been, you know, for the most part, relocating there during college and, and going to the U and um, working with those science service providers we have two, there's two facilities in that area that our athletes kind of go between to um, dedicated ice arenas that is solely for the purpose of curling, which is very important in the sport, which I learned early on. You can't just curl on like, you know, hockey ice or anything like that. It's important to have devoted, um, dedicated curling ice. So there's two facilities that exist up in that, that area. Ideally, we would be building a facility that's attached to where the Vikings have their training facility. Um, I'm not not my not my place of expertise in terms of the brokering those deals or anything like that. But there are conversations that are happening and that would be a huge, huge win for us if that happened, if that facility got built, because then everything is right there on campus at the, the Vikings training facility um, for our athletes. They can live close by. They can, you know, go and train on the ice and then have a sports psych session or go, you know, have their strength and conditioning session and then get on the ice. Um, the dietitian could, you know, come to the ice to, to provide that support. So, I mean, that is hopefully going to happen. We'll see. Um, fingers crossed on that one. Cause that would be huge in terms of it really being a true centralized training program and even opportunity to like pull athletes in. Because the other thing that I've learned, which I wasn't even aware of, um, ice isn't available. This, de the devoted, dedicated curling ice is not available year round. And so I truly, one of our national team athletes was on the 2018 Olympic team that won the gold medal talking to him. He's, you know, He's a little frazzled right now because he's he was on his way for the first time this season to get on ice because the ice that he normally has access to, it doesn't normally open till October, but they've been having some, some issues with the system that produces the ice and obviously all of the infrastructure, just the, you know, some of the things that the arena that need to be in place, you know, they've they're just having some problems there. So on the phone with him as he's traveling to get on ice for the first time. And, you know, you can sense the stress in his voice of like, I haven't been on ice since, since March. This yeah, is <laughs> in my, you know, my curling career. This is the longest I have gone without, you know, being on ice. And so that's something I've heard from other athletes that aren't in an area where they have access to ice year round, that that's something that, you know, I don't, it tends to be in the summer months that the ice isn't in place, but like, what can we do? Um, and so if we did have our own facility that would help with that, even if they don't live in the Twin Cities, being able to come to the Twin Cities, you know, if they're up in Duluth or wherever they may be and just access the ice, even if it was just once a week. So, um, yeah. Well, part of the challenge, I imagine, is getting the, the language and understanding of what the sport of curling is. So in one sentence, if you were explaining to someone who didn't know what curling what the sport of curling entails, how would you describe to someone that's unfamiliar with the sport of curling? Chest on ice. Chest on ice. You might yeah. have to define that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've got a rock and, and, you know, depending there's two different, there's the four person game, which is more traditional. Um, and then, which was introduced in terms of added to the Olympic program in 20, or sorry, 1998. 
And then you have the um, mixed doubles, which, which was just added in 2018 um, to the program. So um, from what I understand, not being a curler myself is the games are different, very different, obviously for the four person, you have four to five people, but four, four people competing. Um, you always have eight rocks that um, someone is, is delivering the rock and placing it. And it becomes essentially how close can you get to a certain a certain spot on the sheet of ice that, it, you know, you want to get it placed. So it's a lot of precision. It's a lot of, um, you know, like angles and knowing how to hit the, the rocks at the right angle. Strategy. <laughs> right. Yeah, tons of strategy. And then on top of that, you have your teammates who are um, sweeping, using brooms to sweep the ice to help, the rock curl at an angle so it can come in and hit maybe your opponent's rock out of the way or whatever, you know, whatever you're trying to in that shot, whatever you're trying to accomplish. And again, that's what the skip is, is dictating is like, okay, they're having a discussion. Okay. What makes sense? Are we going to clear out this rock? Or are we going to try to place our rock over here? Um, so there's a ton of strategy behind it. And I still am, <laughs> Like this last Learning. week, winning, <laughs> yes, there's a lot to learn. And I'm quite honestly, I was like, okay, the, the sports specific stuff, I know I have that handled in terms of some of the people that work with me that have been doing this for a long time, that truly sitting with them this past week, I'm at a competition, a mixed doubles competition. My, um, you know, I consider him our national team director, you know, him saying like, oh yeah, this is what they're going to do without hearing. Cause you're behind the glass. Like you're just watching this, but without even hearing what they're talking about him being able to say, yep, this is what they're going to do. And, and then that's exactly what happens. So, um, you know, the, the people who have been playing the sport for a long time and have been around it, like definitely know the strategy. Like I'm not, I'll leave that to you because I know you have that, um, under, you know, very well covered. So I'm, I'm trying to focus on some of the higher level things around, um, again, some of just these basic policies and procedures, but, um, yes, we'll hopefully learn in hopefully in a year. Well, I don't know if that's even realistic, but in two years, I'll have a, a lot better grasp of the very sports specific. I mean, again, it's a lot of strategy, um, that plays out on the ice. So yeah, it's been fascinating. I've learned a ton already, but I have a lot to learn. Strategy on the ice and strategy for USA curling uh, at large. But thank you so much, Katie, for your insight into curling and the spotlight and uh, this Olympic and Paralympic sport. It's been very fascinating. I look forward to see what you will do uh, two years from now and how the growth of the sports, hopefully that will continue um, along the way. Well, thank you to our viewers for joining us today on the Sports Playbook. In two weeks, our guest is Jason Augie who will discuss his work from the Tampa Bay Sports Commission. We will see you then. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.